Harry's Game by Andy Hamilton, starring James Grout as the Professor, Jimmy Malville as Thomas, Stephen O'Donnell as Gary the Demon, and Andy Hamilton as Satan. Right, let's read this back. <clears throat> Dear Diary, hello. This is my first entry in you. I don't know the date, I'm afraid, because the concept of time does not exist here in hell, which is a bit of a bummer, as it means I get no birthdays and nobody ever turns up for meetings. <laughs> Still, I suppose being trapped in an abstract dimension is just part of the downside of being Satan. The upside is that I get to torture Richard Nixon. <laughs> we have some new arrivals here in the underworld. There's a professor who won't accept that he's died and come to my kingdom. He believes that I'm just something conjured up by his subconscious. He sticks resolutely to this theory, I have discovered, even when you turn his pubic hair into a swarm of angry hornets. <laughs> he also believes, and this is very funny, that man is fundamentally decent. So I have stuck him in a very dark dungeon with a revolting specimen called Thomas, a study in human depravity who makes Jack the Ripper look like Gary Lineker. <laughs> Hail, Prince of Darkness, your demon salutes you. Yeah, 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 whatever. Yeah. You working on your diary? Yeah. Have you included how you pleasured yourself with those naked Ethiopian gymnasts? Nah, I'm only putting in the exciting stuff. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you, well, you haven't seen the red-hot pokers, have you? I can't find them anywhere. Uh, have you looked in Richard Nixon? No, there's none there. <laughs> well, apart from the one that's stuck there. Oh, right. <laughs> you know what's really depressing about starting this diary business? No. Well, when mortals write their diaries, right? One day their pet dog gets knocked down, the day after that they meet someone and fall in love, you know. <laughs> their lives are full of surprises. But down here, well, I mean, the last time we had something surprising happen was when all the damn souls in purgatory started that Mexican wave. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I've had a brilliant idea. Really? Yeah, well, I was thinking. Mm -hmm. We got most things down here in hell. Pits of despair, circles of damnation, various lakes of fire. What's the one thing we haven't got? What? A golf course. <laughs> a golf course. And what does hell need a golf course for? To torment people with. Well, what sort of people? Well, golfers, of course. <laughs> well, you've seen what they put themselves through. I mean, the average round is pure mental torture. Yeah, true, true, true. Ah, but every now and then they have a dream round, don't they? Where every drive sails right down the middle and all the putts are perfect. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not going to happen on a course I've built. You really enjoy your work, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Inflicting suffering. I mean, what better job is there? Uh, yeah, true, yeah. Come on then, let's do the rounds, check up on the inmates. Uh, we'll start with that Belgian timeshare salesman. Oh, I've just remembered where I've left the pokers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Professor, you're going to have to run that by me again. Well, what I'm saying is no. that none of this is real, in the sense that you might use the word real. So I'm not really here in hell? No. Right, so where am I exactly? Well, you're nowhere. This is all a creation of my subconscious. You only exist in my imagination. Oh, oh, right. Well, how do you know that this isn't all a product of my subconscious and that you're not a figment of my imagination? I mean, I could easily be imagining you. I bet I could probably put my hand right through you if I tried, you know, like a ghost. Come on, stand up, see if I can do it. Come on. Uh, I'd rather not stand, if you don't mind. Uh, I don't want to disturb these hornets in my underpants. <laughs> and even though I know they're only imaginary hornets, it's remarkable how real the pain is. Ouch! Stripey little bastards. <laughs> so, you maintain that this is all one big hallucination you're having while you're in a coma? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what put you in this coma? I was in a car smash. Oh, you as well? It's not my fault, I hasten to add. I was the victim of a very selfish road user. <laughs> Tell me about it. I mean, some people just shouldn't be allowed behind the wheel. They should bring in psychological testing. Like they do in France? I couldn't agree more. I mean, the chap who hit me was clearly <laughs> mentally unstable. <laughs> I was driving along, minding my own business, on the A23. The A23? What a coincidence! Yes, it, it was that single lane stretch just outside Guildford. You know it? Yes. <laughs> I know it. And suddenly, there's this fellow right up my backside, banging his horn, flashing his lights, wanting mm -hmm. me to go faster. A big red Porsche. You know, turbocharged penis substitute. <laughs> anyway, I'm observing the speed limit, 40 miles an hour. The road conditions are very greasy, mm -hmm. so I maintain a steady speed. And suddenly, he starts bumping me from behind. Um, what, um, what kind of car were you driving? A Ford Fiesta. <laughs> 
Anyway, I just touch the brakes to warn him off, and then wallop. I'm spinning through the air, bouncing around. For a second, I glimpse the other car vaulting the embankment, but I just keep turning over and over and over. It's funny how it all happens in slow motion. Mm. I wonder why time does slow up. Perhaps the increase in intensity of your perception stretches each moment. And... <laughs> you stupid bastard! You got me killed and wrote off an 80 grand Porsche Carrera! You're not choking me! Good! Is it happening in slow motion? Hmm? Like you're bloody driving, eh? Hey! hey. Oh, and here we find human beings in their natural condition. Namely, each other's throats. And to be strictly accurate, he's at my throat. Gary, separate them. I'll have you, you wimpy, egg-heady, slow-coachy, stupid, arty-farty piece of murdering filth! Uh, you oh. were saying earlier, Professor, about man being so fundamentally decent. I'm going to tear out your intestines and use them as bunting. Well, that sounds like fun. <laughs> now, Professor, you are a rational man. You've now discovered you were killed by this stranger's mindless aggression. And surely that's ample proof that man has all the ethical awareness of a crack-addicted crocodile. No, I can't accept any of that. Firstly, Thomas is just part of this bizarre hallucination that I've just conjured up, although quite why I should choose to imagine someone like him is a bit of a mystery. Second, even if I were, for the sake of argument, to accept any of this as real, and even if Thomas were responsible for the accident... It was your fault! I was simply observing the speed limit. Exactly. What sort of maniac observes a speed limit? You're a menace, man. As I was saying, all sorts of contributory factors have to be taken into account. Genetic predisposition, a phenomenon of road rage, society's obsession with speed, all of them conspiring to produce a moment's madness. And in those circumstances, well, I... I would forgive him. How dare you forgive me? I mean, I mean, if anyone wants you to be doing the forgiving, it should be me. Well, will you forgive him? No, I'm going to have him. <laughs> All right, break it up, break it up, calm down. I'll tell you what, Gary, why don't you take Thomas here for a nice, relaxing round of golf? <laughs> golf? Do you play? Do I play? I won our club's golf tournament six years running. I was known as the Great White Shark of Godalming. Come on, then. <laughs> I'm not in my clubs. Perhaps I could nip up to the living world and fetch them. Hmm? Hmm? You never give up, do you, Thomas? You must have been a lousy scientist, Prof. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, you won't accept the evidence. On the contrary, I'm too good a scientist to accept the evidence at face value. Mm. So the pubic hornets haven't changed your mind, then? <laughs> well, they don't prove anything, no. Oh, well, I might as well get rid of them, then. I'll send them back to Richard Nixon. Oh, <laughs> You know, you intrigue me. In fact, I put you in my diary. You're keeping a diary? Well, trying to. Living in a dimension without time makes it a bit formless. I mean, you're a boffin. What is time, anyway? Ah, oh, well, scientifically, it's a very difficult concept. I think the best definition I can give you is that time is what stops everything happening all at once. <laughs> time is what stops everything happening all at once. Oh, well, that's very helpful. Thanks a bunch. <laughs> I mean, there, there is a kind of dingy light down here, so if you've got light, I suppose technically you've got a form of time. And there is chronology and that things happen in sequence. Yeah, yes, but, yes, but nothing ever starts or stops. You know, nothing grows and so nothing dies. No, no landmarks, no contrast, no ups, no downs. It's like living in Norfolk. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, it's not quite as bad as that, but... <laughs> So, uh, what branch of boffinhood were you, then? Well, by training, I'm a physicist. But I like to see myself as something of a polymath. Ooh, do you know? A polymath? Ooh, well, I never. A polymath is a person who studies many things. I knew that. <laughs> I know most things, actually. I did used to be an angel, you know. Quite a high-ranking angel, as it happens. Had my own harp and everything. Mm. That was before, um... What, the fall? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That must have been a rather distressing experience for you. Well, you know how it is. Once you've had a nasty fall, you tend to lose your confidence for a bit, you know. <laughs> I got over it, though. I threw myself into tempting mankind into sin. <laughs> Not that that's ever represented much of a challenge. Oh, here we go again. Well, it's true. Corrupting a human being is about as hard as beating an Englishman at tennis. Well, you can't, you can't write the whole of humanity off like that. For every Adolf Hitler, there are a thousand Florence Nightingales. She's down here. <laughs> Florence Nightingale. But she laid the foundations for modern nursing. She led a selfless, inspirational life. Why on earth would she be here? 
Well, for taking advantage of all those wounded soldiers. <laughs> oh, come on. It's true. She had it all the time. She, I can show it to you. She's languishing in the Lake of Fire, the Victorian section. It's a very big section. Full of men with burnt beards. <laughs> no, no, you're making all this up. And even if you're not, it still wouldn't win me over to your disease view of mankind. All right, all right, we'll do it your way. We'll have a scientific experiment, OK? You pick the most incorruptible human being you can think of, and I'll go up top and prove that they are fundamentally rotten to the core. Oh, police. Come on, come on, anyone you like. Nelson Mandela, the Queen Mum, Des Lynham. <laughs> no, no, I refuse to play this silly game. Harry Seacombe, Trevor MacDonald, come on. How about you, missus? Well, you wouldn't be able to corrupt Deborah. And why not? Well, because she's the most decent and honourable person I know. Right. Then she's the experiment. This won't take long. Going up. Oh, brilliant. Trust me to materialise in a compost heap. <laughs> Ugh. Now, what guise shall I appear to her in? I won't do Keanu Reeves again. Just got followed around by loads of men with chunky moustaches. <laughs> ah, ah, I know. Yes, that's a good guise. OK, here goes. Up the path and... Yes? Deborah Whittingham. That's me, yes. <coughs> Rex, Rex! Shut up, Rex! What's the matter with you, boy? I'm sorry, I've never seen him do this before. I, I, I'll go and shut up <coughs> the kitchen. I... Oh, sorry. He's daft. Yeah, well, maybe not that daft. I just came round to pay my respects over your sad loss. Oh, you're a friend of Richard's. Oh, please, come in. Mr... Um, Connery. Stan Connery. <laughs> well, isn't that a coincidence? What? Well, hasn't anyone ever told you that you bear an extraordinary resemblance to the actor Sean Connery? Really? Yes! <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite spooky, actually. You're not, you're not related, are you? No, no. <laughs> Would you like some tea? That'd be lovely. So, where are you from? Uh, down under. Oh, and that's where you met Richard? Uh-huh, yeah. Mm. Well, he loved those research trips to Australia. You know, I keep expecting him to walk through that door. It hasn't really hit me yet. Though goodness knows what it'll be like when it does. When I finally realise he's gone. Well, he's... He's not gone, really. Oh, so you believe in an afterlife, Mr Connery? Well, I put money on it. Oh, it must be wonderful to be so certain about things. One of Richard's great assets. Certainty. Yes, it is. Was. Was. Uh, who are those unattractive individuals? Oh, just some local yobs. They're constantly coming here, making a nuisance of themselves, shouting abuse, urinating on my lawn. I'm an easy target, I suppose, a woman on her own. I mean, I've tried calling the police, but they're useless. I mean, good grief! What? Well, they're all running away with flames shooting out of their ears. Oh, oh yes. Well, that's not something you see every day, is it? <laughs> well, what an extraordinary thing. What do you think caused that? Well, who can say? Oh, well, good riddance. I don't know. We're turning into a yobocracy, Mr Connery. It's everywhere. I mean, take that aggressive lout who ploughed into my poor husband's car. If there is an afterlife, I hope he's very, very painful. Oh, I wouldn't worry. I'm sure he's getting what he deserves. I will not stand for this. I am the Emperor Hirohito, Imperial ruler of all Japan, Terrestrial Cotted, Supreme Commander, of Japanese hobby. And my caddy, so shut your gob and hand me the seven iron. <laughs> no! I will not carry this golf bag one step further. It is a degrading humiliation and insult, and I will not look. Up there, you may have been ruler and divine being to a race of very gullible short asses, but down here, <laughs> you are just another sad, lost crap wet. Now, hand me that seven iron, or I'll put you back in that very tall vat of camel spits. The seventh arm. Thank you. <laughs> I see you managed to get out of that bunker then, Thomas. Yes, it, uh, it wasn't easy. Ninety foot's quite deep for a bunker, isn't it? <laughs> I designed it to be a challenging course. <laughs> oh, it's certainly that. Um, <clears throat> Gary? Yeah? I, uh, I just wanted to say how 
impressed I've been with you. I, you're obviously a very talented demon. I do all right. No, 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 no. Don't sell yourself short. I've seen you in action. For instance, I watched you with that disc jockey, <laughs> welding shut every orifice, sparks <laughs> flying from your trident. Very impressive, I said to myself. Thanks. <laughs> Of course, that professor chap, he wasn't so impressed. He said it was just a cheap trick. Did he? Yeah, quite dismissive about you, he was, in fact. Said Satan was the organ grinder and you were very much the monkey. He said that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But cheeky of him, really, because with your magnificent powers, you could probably do something really horrible to him, couldn't you? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I mean, you could probably arrange for a nuclear explosion in his bowels or something, couldn't you? Nice one. Yeah, or you could insert a shoal of piranha in his gut that would devour him from the inside out. You could do that, couldn't you? Yeah, I'd yeah, probably yeah. manage that one, yeah. Yeah. In fact, I bet if you put your mind to it, you could annihilate that smug, patronising, speed limit observing, over-educated ninny disperse him into a billion tiny fragments of shimmering flesh dust. Oh, stop it, you're getting me turned on. <laughs> right, here goes. Just made it onto the green. (laughs) You putt first. You're nicely positioned there. Yeah, but I don't think I'm likely to sink the putt somehow, do you? Why not? Because there's no bloody hole in the green. Mm. Well, it's not an easy shot, I grant you. It's impossible. (laughs) It's ludicrous. Look, you've you've got a flag with a pin, but no hole. All right, I'll putt first. You cannot get a ball down a hole that isn't... Where did that hole come from? <laughs> eh? The hole just appeared in front of your ball. Yeah, well, you've got to know how to read the greens. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with reading the greens. Look, just putt, Right, okay? right, 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 I will, I will. My putting's my strong point. Here I go... Where's it gone? The hole's disappeared. It was there a moment ago. It's not fair. Catch up with us on the next team. Come on, here But the, 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 I'm raising this with the club captain. <laughs> Panic, Richard. Uh, Don't let this strange experience intimidate you. There's a rational explanation for everything. With the possible exception of Geoffrey Archer's success. (laughs) Well profited it. Did what? Corrupted your missus. You look exactly like Sean Connery. Hey? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to change. Hang on. That's better. Nice to have the old who's back. I don't know how you lot can stand having toes, fiddly, messy little things. It's like having frayed feet. (laughs) What have you done to Deborah? I didn't do anything to her. Oh, good. I did something with her. What? Oh, come on. I don't have to spell it out for you, do I, Prof? (laughs) I did it with your wife. You know, it. You know, the dance of the bouncing buttocks. (laughs) I've got it on video. I'll show it to you if you like. No, no, no. That won't be necessary. I think my experiment successfully proves that even within a paragon of virtue like your Deborah, there lies the usual septic tank of depravity. No, no, no. I'm not going to listen to this. Take your fingers out of your ears. I'm telling you, me and your missus went upstairs and played hide the sausage. It wasn't difficult. As soon as I gave her the money, she just came across with the goods and that was it. Money? What, you offered her money to... That's right. Half a million pounds. I mean, basically, it was a shortcut because I couldn't be bothered to chat her up. (laughs) Such a waste of time, isn't it? All that sitting there pretending to be interested in them as a person. (laughs) What's so funny? Oh, well, I think your sick little experiment just invalidated itself. How? Well, you see, I, I never earned much of a wage. The faculty was always starved of cash. And I didn't get much from that tiny bit of TV I did. I bet you presented programmes for the Open University. That's right. Thought so, but tell from the haircut. <laughs> so, in short, we've no money put by, and uh, Deborah's mother is in a nursing home. So if a stranger came by and offered an extraordinary amount of money, which, money which would secure a high standard of care for her poor mother, well then, performing the uh, sexual act in those circumstances would have a rather high moral purpose, wouldn't it? Whoa, 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 whoa. And whoa. then there's this Sean Connery thing. Eh? Well, frankly, Deborah's always had a thing about Sean Connery. And that, plus the money business, <laughs> you've hardly proved she's corrupt. I mean... Look, it's... I only chose Sean Connery at random. No, I'm sorry. Oh, all right, all right, play it your way. We'll have another experiment. She'll get offered no money this time, and I'll be ugly. In, in fact, I'll show you how ugly. Here I go. I'll have... The legs of a sumo wrestler. The body of David Meller. (laughs) 
Jack Charlton's neck. <laughs> Michael Portillo's lips. <laughs> the nose of the late Golda Meir. <laughs> the eyes of Jeremy Beadle. <laughs> and the hair of Arthur Scargill. <laughs> All topped off with the colouring of Robin Cook and the voice of John Major. <laughs> and thus disguised as the most physically repulsive person imaginable, I shall prove that, sexually speaking, all human beings are anybody's for a sherbet dip. Oh, yes. <laughs> Going up. Right. Here we go. Hello. Oh, you poor man. Have you been in an accident? Oh, come in, lie down. I'll call the emergency services. How are you getting on, Thomas? Oh, this is much more like it. Nice, straight, fairway, even, flat green with a hole in it. Mind you, it doesn't look like I'm going to get round under par, given that I scored infinity on the first. Mm. <laughs> that was bad luck, wasn't mm. it? Five iron, please, Hirohito. Oh, I thought she was so iron. Thank you. Right. Oh, too much bottom hand. Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> nice shot. You know, uh, I'm afraid this is just the beginning. Sorry? Well, all this lip you're getting from little Emperor Tojo there. You're going to get a lot more of this sort of disobedience. Hey? Well, you see, I've heard rumblings. How do you mean, rumblings? Well, to be perfectly frank, Gary, nobody takes you very seriously around here. In fact, I, I've heard some very disrespectful things said about you. You're losing your authority. Really? Well, it is. You've gone soft. And you know what that leads to? Dissent, disobedience. Before you know who you are, you've got a real law and order problem. If I were you... I'd make an example of somebody. Yes, that's what I'd do. Me too. <laughs> what about the um, professor bloke? He's very uppity, isn't he? Mm. Why don't you, uh, I don't know, just obliterate him? And that would reassert my authority. I always used to invade Manchuria. <laughs> yes, thank you. Well, I suppose I'd better obliterate the professor then. Yes! Yes, I think that's a very sensible course of action for you. Uh, yeah, you've got quite an easy lie there, Thomas. Yeah, 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 it's quite a... Shallow bunker, faces onto the green. That's right. The, uh, the only thing you've got to watch out for in that bunker, really, is the, um, the invisible dragon. <laughs> it's an interesting phenomenon, though, isn't it? I mean, why is my subconscious conjuring up a fantasy where Satan pays siege to my wife? I mean, what does that say about me? I must be pretty sick to imagine all this. Unless I'm, I'm not imagining it. <laughs> no, no, no. A fire and brimstone hell is an absurd notion. I mean, apart from anything else, it would involve Jehovah's Witnesses being right. <laughs> I did it again. What? I did... Hang on, while I change out of this manifestation. <laughs> Yeah, how does Major put up with that voice? <laughs> like having a boa constrictor wrapped round your larynx. Where was it? Oh, yes, I did it again, Prof. Carnal knowledge of your wife, and this time no offer of money. It was just pure animal lust. Rubbish. It's true. Nonsense. She has a small tattoo on the inside of her right thigh. A rose. Oh, my God. There. Now you have to accept it. I rolled up as a total stranger at your house, looking like I'd been badly drawn by Picasso, and your wife... I don't want to talk about it. Besides, this isn't happening. You're, you're, you're an illusion. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Is she OK? Well, bearing up, I'd say. Uh, two of the goldfish have died and the hoover's playing up. <laughs> Apart from that. And uh, in either of your, uh, <clears throat> your visits, uh, did she talk about me? No. No, not for a moment, no. So... That's that. We accept, do we, that the experiment has been concluded and that mankind's total venality has been confirmed? Good. Now, if you'll excuse Not me... Not at all. I accept no such thing. What? Well, if, as you claim, I'm dead, then poor Deborah is grieving, and, and grief does funny things to people. She, she'd be emotionally disorientated, lonely, and, and whatever she did, and for whatever reason, I forgive her. Oh, you're just trying to annoy me now. <laughs> well, you certainly haven't proved she's corrupt, just that she's vulnerable and needy. <laughs> it's all part of the human condition. 
I mean, all to do with having feelings, something you'd find very hard to understand. Listen, I don't want your feelings. You lot use them as an excuse for anything. I'm sorry I murdered your granny, but I was upset you hurt my feelings. All right, boss. No, I'm not. This one's driving me bananas. How was the golf? Well, I enjoyed it. Thomas had a bit of a sticky round, though. I think your swing was affected by the dragon bites, wasn't it, Thomas? <laughs> Gary, he's there. Look, now's your chance. Let the professor have it. Oh, right, yeah. Let me have what? Well, this, basically. He's gone! Yes, he's gone! Blown to smithereens, blasted out of existence, yes. Take that, Mr. 39.9 miles an hour. <laughs> Revenge is mine. Oh, that was great. Yeah, it was good, wasn't it? Yeah. We often blow people up, especially if we're bored. Mm. It's good fun, isn't it, Gary? Oh, it's great fun. Yeah, we blow them up and then we put them back together again. Yeah. <laughs> what? Oh, don't put him back together again. Good Lord, what happened there? Uh, your fellow human being here tried to have you annihilated, but don't worry. He was probably just feeling vulnerable and needy. Yes, yes, I expect so. He's been under a lot of stress. Are you seriously saying you don't feel any hatred towards this repugnant creature? Hatred's a futile, wasteful emotion. Oh, come on, Gary, let's go. I suddenly feel very tired. Please, please, Gary, do it to him again. Only this time, permanently, please. You haven't quite got the hang of this place, have you, Thomas? We can make you explode a million times, but you'll still be here. Nothing can change. Oh, God! Still, it's nice to know where you stand, eh? Catch you later. Ah, this whole thing just gets more fascinating. <laughs> you hate me, really, don't you? Good Lord, no. No. Uh, just shut this dungeon door, shall we? A bit of a draught. Why don't you hate me? Because that's what sets us apart from the animals. Our ability to rise above our negative emotions, baser instincts... To be objective and compassionate, that's the ultimate glory of man. Ah! Ow! Oh! Ah! Ow! I'm dreadfully sorry, my dear chap. You don't catch your fingers in the door. <laughs> You're right, Prince of Darkness. What's the matter? Oh, it's this diary. I've got nothing to put in it. Yes, you have. You slept with the professor's missus twice. You proved how utterly, utterly vile humans are. The professor doesn't think so. Well, you proved it to yourself, then. No, I didn't. You mean she didn't? No. No, I just said she did. To see if I could shake those nauseating convictions of his. No, the first time, when the Sean Connery lookalike offered her all that money, she just slapped me. And the second time, all she gave me was some tea and biscuits in the name of a good cosmetic surgeon. <laughs> I was going to proposition her, but she started talking about the professor and how she missed him. And I don't know, I just couldn't bring myself to do it somehow. So you didn't do anything, then? Well, I tried to fix her hoover, but... <laughs> and how did you know about the tattoo? Well, she told me about it. She had it done on their honeymoon. She was reminiscing, and then she started to cry. It's a lovely sound, isn't it? <laughs> the funny thing is, Gary, as I sat there on her sofa, just, just for a moment, I thought, I wonder what it would be like to have someone to come home to. Someone who'd give you tea and biscuits. Who'd miss you when you weren't there? Oh, makes your blood run cold just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm s sorry about that, Gary. <laughs> Must be going soft. Uh, now, I've got a cure for that. It's very simple. You have to make an example out of somebody. Richard Nixon? I'll fetch the pokers. <laughs> <laughs> Old Harry's Game featured Andy Hamilton as Satan, James Grout as the Professor, Jimmy Marvel as Thomas and Stephen O'Donnell as Gary, with Philip Pope, Penelope Nice and Jasper Jacob. The programme was written by Andy Hamilton and produced by Paul Mayhew Archer. <laughs>